I discovered Ayodhya through uh, traveling around the bad way. Near me, uh, I was in India, and um, uh, this was in Varanasi. And every morning, I went to read my newspapers with my feet in the mud of the riverside of the Ganga. It must have been quite a sight. And um, so I read about the budding uh, Salman Rushdie affair. This was the time of the Satanic Verses, 1988. And um, there was something strange about it, namely, there was a big debate among Indian secularists. Okay? Not to speak of the Hindu crowd, you know. There was a debate among the secularists. And the hardliners, the communists, like uh, in front line, were very much on the side of free speech of Rusdi, who was in a way one of them, he's a Trotskyite. And um, not at all in favor of the mullahs and the Sayyid Shahabuddin, the Muslim leader who had started all this. Whereas the um, Congress side secularists, like Kushwan Singh, like uh, M.J. Akbar, today BJP ideologue, but back then in Congress, they defended the ban. So uh, I, I thought this was strange. And I, what does this have to do with secularism, I thought? You see, in Europe, secularism would logically mean that you favor criticism of religion, the freedom to criticize religion. And that turned out not to be the case in India. And indeed, rather soon, it dawned on me that the criterion for uh, someone who talks about India without understanding anything about it, uh, which counted for most Western India watchers and Indologists, was that they think that secularism in India means secularism. So that turned out not to be the case. Um, now, what does the Rusi affair have to do with Ayodhya? The um, start of it was when Sayyid Shahabuddin had announced a march on Ayodhya, which was going to coincide with some Hindu festival there. And Rajiv Gandhi, the Prime Minister, invited him and said, look, you know, this is a surefire um, bloodbath that you're announcing. We want you to, uh, to scrap this march, but, you know, we're willing to give you something in return what you want. And so one of the things he wanted was the banning of this book. So this became a worldwide affair with uh, several of his translators murdered, with demonstrations all over, with a death sentence against Rusty by the uh, Ayatollah in Iran. <laughs> but so all that started in India with the Ayodhya affair. <coughs> So that's when I started researching Ayodhya. Um, just uh, a few days after, in November uh, 1998, I lost my passport or it was stolen or something. So I had to go to Delhi uh, to the embassy. And that took a few days. So I was waiting around and filling my time usefully. And that's when I. Uh, went looking around for interesting literature in Darya Ganj, in the area of the publishers. And in uh, the bookshop of Upal Publishers, I saw a title that interested me greatly, namely History of Hindu-Christian Encounters. So I bought the book, I read it at one stretch. The next day, <laughs> I happened to be there again. And so the bookseller asked me what I thought of the book. I thought it was great. And then he said, well, wait a minute. Maybe you want to talk to the author. So uh, yes, yes, OK. Well, yeah, he has an office just uh, the next street. And then he made a call. He said to arrange for that afternoon. And that's when I met Sitaram Gowal. And so he explained me the whole affair because there are many things that, as an outsider, you don't know. And so at the end of the conversation, I said, well, you see, that's a really interesting thing to investigate. I'm going to write a book about it. And, you know, he was friendly and so on. 
he told, <laughs> he told me afterwards that he smirked behind my back thinking, oh, nothing will come of it. But uh, a few months later, I was there with uh, a book on Ayodhya, which I don't think, looking back, was a very important book or a very good book, but it had the merit of um, proving something. You see, in the preceding years, in the second half of the 80s, an atmosphere had been created that certainly there never was a temple underneath the mosque. That's only an invention by the Hindu forces. And so, until then, you see, there was a consensus that of course there had been a temple there. Like uh, in the 1880s, just a hundred years before, a British judge had sentenced that, yeah, of course there was a temple there. Nobody in his court had denied that. The Muslims also had accepted that. But they nevertheless claimed their right to have their mosque. And so he said, well, you know, it, it's true that, you know, a temple has been demolished there, and that's a pity, we shouldn't do it. But since it happened so long ago, well, let's just let it stand, you know, let's uh, let the status quo prevail. Then in the 1989 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, it is simply given as a fact, as a totally uncontroversial fact, that the mosque was built in replacement of a Hindu temple. So there was absolutely no news about it. And so what I did in fact in that book was simply to reaffirm that consensus. And why was that spectacular? Because in the preceding few years, the uh, eminent historians, as they call each other, the <laughs> eminent historians had uh, started propagating the idea that there never was a temple there and issuing a statement, not entirely giving the Muslim viewpoint. You see, the building had not been used as a mosque already for decades, so they thought it was moderate and sensible and reasonable to propose to just declare the mosque a national monument. That was their position. But so, meanwhile, they smuggled along this idea that there had never been a temple there, that this was just a Hindu Twa invention. Now, since the Hindu Twa people, and I mean, I don't want to say anything about any of you, or of our uh, chairman or so, but nevertheless, someone else somewhere claims that they are the bad guys, and so the whole Western academe and the, the press correspondence and that we went on, they all decided that, uh, you know, these Hindu Twa people had invented, you know, that this was one of their dirty tricks. They're up to no good. And so what should have been called the scholarly consensus suddenly became the Hindu Twa claim. And, you know, all these uh, supposedly scientifically minded academics, they followed suit. They absolutely parroted whatever the eminent historians told them. So, when I gave a paper at the International Ramayana Conference, which that year coincidentally happened to take place in my home university, um, when there I gave a paper showing that, yes, of course, there was a temple there, I was totally vomited out. <laughs> And so immediately I was a persona non grata in the logical circles. I've remained so ever since. Uh, and so therefore, I found it personally rather gratifying to finally have the Supreme Court come over to our side and declare that, oh yeah, well after all, the place belongs to the Hindus. Now let's make a big jump to uh, the last few months. Unlike the Uttar Pradesh High Court 10 years ago, which had ruled in favor of the Hindu claim and had explicitly cited the scholarly evidence, the present verdict is rather non committal about the evidence. 
you see, for those people who care to read it in detail, well, some remaining eminent historian might say, well, actually, he didn't say we were wrong, strictly speaking. Though, of course, the verdict cannot be read except against the background of uh, already a scholarly consensus that, indeed, of course, there had been a temple there, plenty of documentary evidence, plenty of archaeological evidence. But so, strictly speaking, uh, if they wanted to, the eminent historians could still claim, well, we've not really been vindicated, but we've not been put in the dock either. Uh, it is thanks to uh, Minakshi that we know in far more detail how, um, well, how humiliated the eminent historians were when they appeared in the witness stand in the Uttar Pradesh High Court and completely collapsed and, you know, stammered, you know, that they had never been to Ayodhya, they weren't archaeologists, they had only signed because all the others did. And so the, the body of evidence that supposedly existed, that many people believe existed on the anti-temple side, turned out to evaporate like that. So the, the ultimate verdict, uh, even though I find it intellectually not entirely satisfying, at least ultimately, you know, let's not fuss about details. Ultimately, it did the right thing. It left a uh, Hindu sacred site to Hindu. So that's what is really, really good about it. Um, and and, and <laughs> that is, of course, also what makes a complete mockery of the 70 years that this litigation has lasted. You see? There was a big controversy, you know, governments have fallen over it, big riots have taken place, people killed, a totally new form of terrorism was started. Uh, if you know, on 12th March 93, the uh, Muslim terrorists took revenge for the demolition of the Babri Masjid on 6 December 92 namely by installing a number of bombs at different places in Mumbai, including the Stock Exchange, killing several hundred people. That is a formula for terror that has been repeated a number of times in London, in New York, in Madrid, in Paris, in Brussels, and so on. And of course, in Delhi, and in Srinagar, and in many other Indian cities. Okay, so all that happened for ultimately nothing. For ultimately finding in a Supreme Court sentence something that should have been obvious to everyone, namely a Hindu place of pilgrimage belongs to the Hindus. You see, if you say, well, you know, the main place of pilgrimage of the Muslims, namely Mecca, is administered by Muslims, in fact, even to the point that non-Muslims are not allowed to enter the city, then, well, you see, nobody will be surprised. You know, that the Vatican is run by Catholics. You know, isn't that the most normal thing in the world? So, finally, here, uh, normality has prevailed. You see, that is the most important thing to remember about the verdict. It is a restoration of normality. In fact, 2019 has been the year of the restoration of normality in India, because the preceding uh, change in the status of Kashmir is also a return to normality. Here for 70 years, you had the completely abnormal situation, not existed in any other country, that a province of this sovereign country was off limits to most of its own citizens. So that has been restored. You see, there has been quite a bit of criticism of the BJP government that they were not doing anything serious for Hinduism. Well, that was the first step in the right direction. 
so the uh, the verdict came under the same constellation, shall I say, though that was not a government initiative. Strictly speaking, the government had nothing to do with it. Though, realistically speaking, of course, the, the sort of pro-Hindu uh, atmosphere that had come about after this these years of BJP rule has certainly played a role. Um, okay, so that happened, you see. The, um, all the attempts by the eminent historians and their friends in the media have come to nothing. That's something to rejoice about. Uh, the Hindus can build their temple. Then let's look at what comes after. I have just talked to a top politician, someone belonging to the establishment, about the um, plans for Ayodhya and particularly uh, there exists a very uh, prestigious, very professional collection of art pertaining to Hanuman. So the curator of that, uh, the son of K.C. Aryan, who started this collection, um, seeks to endow that collection with a proper museum, preferably in Ayodhya, where Hanuman-related things belong. And so um, that politician told us that Ayodhya is going to be completely transformed. It's becoming some kind of a Vatican of Hinduism. And so, of course, uh, a Hanuman collection will have a place there. Many things related to the Ramayana, to the Ramayana culture in all uh, Southeast Asia and so on. Uh, that will all be represented there. Well, and, and that brings me to the most, uh, the more constructive suggestions I have to make in this regard. This, uh, this new temple ought to be a model of where a Hindu government wants to take temple culture in India. I mean, if you care anyhow about uh, Hindu Dharma, and I think Hindu temples have a very central place in that. So, there has recently been some agitation about the fact that the Hindu temples have a very poor status in India, are being uh, taken over by greedy politicians or by politicians who seek cheap popularity, cheap in the sense of having someone else pay for it. Um, so by, by nationalizing temples and then siphoning off the funds generated by these temples to secular projects or even to uh, churches and mosques. I remember uh, some nearly 10 years ago, there was this uh, this discovery in the Padma Navi temple in Kerala. I remember it very well because a few days earlier I had been there. So ever since, you see, when people invite me, I warn them, you see, if you invite me, then very likely a few days later you're going to find a treasure. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that treasure was found. Now it is a very interesting reading all the secular papers the next day were immediately drawing up plans. Oh, we're going to take this money and we're going to do this with it and that with it and provide social services and, you know, all the nice, good things they wanted to do with somebody else's money. Right. Uh, but anyway, that, that is the general attitude of politicians towards temples, which they cannot afford against mosques and uh, churches because the constitution discriminates against Hindus. It protects uh, any Muslim or Christian initiative where it does not protect Hindu initiatives and so makes them up for grabs for politicians. Okay, so that should stop and a very good step in that direction is the constitution of a trust by the government 
where there is not going to be any politicians. It's going to be purely run by religious personnel. So that's a very important step in the right direction. Now, of course, when you say A, you should also say B. So the law has to be amended so that things like the nationalization of 50-something temples in Uttarakhand uh, can no longer take place. And, and those nationalized temples should be restored. Uh, of course, I am aware what arguments are being used for the nationalization. They usually point to the uh, prevalence of corruption in whatever private management boards exist. Now, this problem is there, not always, but it is a problem that really exists. Now, for that, there are solutions. You see, in the business world nowadays, there are audits and uh, all kinds of procedures to control what is happening with the money, to, to guarantee transparency and so on. So that should happen in these boards also. I, I don't have the technical details about that, but I know that there's an easy solution which is different from nationalization. But that's certainly one thing that should be done. Then uh, temples should be restored to their proper function. In classical India, temples were centers of Hindu life, centers of education, of arts, and um, so they have been deprived of that function mainly in the British period. And then that has continued afterwards with hostile governments like in Tamil Nadu, taking over temple lands, strictly speaking, allowing the temples to function, but making it very difficult for them, taking away the means to do it. Uh, so those are things to be reversed. And so I'm, this is not a place for the details of that, but you see, policy should be taken in that direction. And then something else. Um, the Hindu movement has always said that there were three places they wanted to restore. Namely, Ayodhya, Kashi, and Mathura. In Mathura, you strictly speaking, you have a, a stable situation. You know, with the, the, the Krishna's Janma Bhumi has been occupied by a mosque, but nobody suffers from that in the sense that there is a new Hindu temple, a new birthplace temple, <coughs> not on the birthplace, but just next to it. And in between, there's barbed wire and soldiers with machine guns and so on. So they're neatly kept apart. And so far, uh, if you don't mind barbed wire and so on, <coughs> then you could say that the situation is satisfactory because no riots take place. And then in uh, Kashi, a similar situation with the peculiarity that the Gyanwapi um, Mosque that came in its place that Aurangzeb built uh, still has uh, some remains of the preceding temple worked into the mosque, so you can easily see it. And in fact, that was done on purpose, namely to show off the victory of Islam uh, over the infidels that is you. You know what an infidel is? Yeah, it's going to hell. So as for Islamic hell, we will all be together. <laughs> but you see, the Christians have a similar system. You see, they also say that all pagans go to hell, but their definition of pagans is a little different. They think they are not, and the Muslims are, right? Um, so, but you, you people certainly are. You people are idolaters, and so the situation is that, you know, I'm baptized, so I go to heaven, whereas <laughs> you all go to hell. <laughs> See, that's why we get together today, because we never know when it will be over, and then we'll never meet again. <laughs> and as St. Thomas Aquinas says, you see, one of the great things about being in heaven is that you can look down on the people suffering in hell. <laughs> <laughs> However, what he didn't know is that Hindus are not going to suffer, because what is hell? You, see, you know it's a very fiery place. So Hindus will feel at home there, because is one big everlasting Agnihotra. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Okay, now back to uh, practical politics. So what to do about Kasi and Matura? Uh, about, about Kasi, if, uh, if I am to believe the secularists, then uh, Modi is preparing a new Ayodhya over there. In this summer there was a conference in Leiden of the uh, Association of Asia Scholars and there was one session organized entirely by Koreans and it was very interesting because their attitude to India is not very hostile. Uh, I mean, if, if you see some of these people like Sheldon Pollock or Wendy Doniger, just look at their, their body language, their faces, you see, they hate you. Whereas the Koreans don't have anything like that. Nevertheless, they do say the same things as the secularists because those are their only source. And so the professors who were there, they had all done their PhD in JNU, typically. Um, and so they were completely misinformed. And so they had taken over the habit of the secularists of, you know, conspiracy thinking about Hinduism. They always see some evil design behind everything that Hinduism people do. So what has happened in uh, Kashi is uh, some, some road has been built and opened from the site of the Vishwanath, the Anwarpi Mosque, uh, to the river. And the consequence of that is that now if you take the boat on the river and you look at that site, you can see the Gyanwapi Mosque. And um, so according to one of these Koreans, this was a ploy in order to sensitize everyone to the Islamic uh, injustice committed against Hindus to fire up some new Ayodhya movement. Well, unless I am very misinformed myself, I don't think that that is the case. Uh, this was just a very innocent public work. Um, and it didn't change anything. It made this thing more visible, but everybody already knows the story. You see, in, in the case of Ayodhya, the true story was, of course, in reality, well known. There was a temple there, but at least for a while, historians had created the impression that there was a controversy that we didn't really know. Whereas about Kashi and Mathura, it's clear. Uh, so, okay, we, we know what the story is, now what to do with it? Well, on the one hand, uh, I think Hindus are being very modest in demanding only three places. They could demand it thousands, could have demanded thousands. Uh, and indeed, you see on Twitter and so on, you do meet some Hindu uh, hotheads who, who, who claim all of them. Now, personally, I'm not in favor of that. Why? Because temples are only a symptom. Of course, I don't want to belittle the importance of temples within Hinduism as sort of uh, every temple is a focus of divine energy that is constantly cultivated by the rituals done there, by the faith that the worshippers bring there. Uh, nevertheless, there are only Hindu temples because there are Hindus. And there are only mosques because there are Muslims, right? When, um, when the Buddhists were murdered by the Muslim invaders, many of these Buddhist temples fell empty. There was no one there anymore to conduct the rituals and the rest. So in a number of cases where the temples were not destroyed, uh, Brahmins took over the temple service, like in the Bodh Gaya temple, uh, it became de facto a Shiva temple and so Brahmins for centuries on end just tended the place um, and without really chopping away the Buddhist remains there, not at all. Um, so now similarly, if something happens that none of you expects, namely that Muslims start leaving Islam in droves, then Many of these mosques are also going to stand on use, and then they are free for a return to Hinduism. And so, 
Frankly, you should be ambitious enough to want that rather than a return of the temples. You should want a return of the souls of the estranged Hindus who have become Muslims. Because that's what most Indian Muslims are. You see, they were Hindus so many generations ago who under duress, sometimes under physical uh, coercion, but mostly under social pressure, uh, turned over to the other side. Like if you had a trial with your neighbor about something, you know, and you were not sure of winning or, or you were sure of losing, you could turn the tables on him by converting. Because it could not happen, Muslims could not conceive that a Hindu would win a trial against a Muslim. So, you see, they deep down they are Hindus, or some of them have foreign ancestry, but then it's the same thing, deep down their ancestors were Parsis or <coughs> something else, Buddhist or so. And so, when they come back, they will bring their mosques back. Now that's the general answer. As for uh, Kashi and Mathura, there you shouldn't give up too easily. And, but there you see, really, I, um, I leave it up to you, you know, to decide. I think it is just and fair that at least these two places also come back. <laughs>